Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Matt's just adding one more thing to his presentation uh, before we get started. And feel free to type into the chat where you're Zooming from. We already have some folks uh, from Alaska and Arizona, which is super cool. Uh, during this presentation, Matt will be presenting all about MODIS and the network that he almost single-handedly is building uh, for the Bird Conservancy. So we'll talk a little bit about what it is, uh, how we're using it to, to track birds and to learn more about birds during migration. Um, and then we'll also have some time uh, for questions in the middle and then questions at the end. So if you have any questions that come up, uh, feel free to type them into the chat and I'll monitor that. Um, but we will be asking if anyone has questions, we'll allow you to unmute at that time as well. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time, Matt, for coming out uh, into your home onto the Zoom uh, and, and teaching us all a little bit more about MODIS. So I'm gonna pass it off to you. Sounds good, thank you, Tyler. And uh, thanks for having me here today. It's always good to be able to talk about the work that we do um, and be able to share you know, our specific projects with uh, people who are interested in it. So um, yeah, I'll just jump right in. Um, yeah, as Tyler said, my name is Matt Webb. Um, I'm an avian ecologist with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And I wanna tell you about my uh, work here at Bird Conservancy developing out a uh, MODIS wildlife tracking system network across the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert to study the movement of grassland birds. So uh, I work for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We um, have a three-pronged approach to conserve birds and their habitat through uh, science, stewardship, and education. Our work uh, stretches from uh, all across the Rockies down into the Great Plains, from Canada down into Mexico. So we're, we're uh, international in our focus as well. And a lot of our work focuses on grassland birds in particular, uh, not all of our work, but a lot of it does. And that's, that's what I'm gonna tell you about a little bit today. So um, as you may know, grassland birds are experiencing some of the steepest declines of any um, avian guild. Their populations have declined over 50% uh, in the last 50 years. So we've lost more than half of the grassland birds that existed 50 years ago. Um, birds such as Baird's sparrow that you see here have been experiencing some of the steeper de declines of any of the grassland birds. Others are uh, thick-billed longspurs, chestnut-collared longspurs, sprigs, pipits, um, and several more of the uh, grassland sparrows. So understanding the causes of these declines is extremely complex. It involves uh, multiple components across the entire annual cycle. Um, it also stretches across multiple continents. And so it makes it quite difficult to uh, do that work because you're working across borders, not just state borders, region borders, but national borders as well. This map here shows the breeding and uh, wintering range, the full annual cycle range of Baird's Sparrow uh, specifically. You can see that they breed up into Canada um, and they winter down into Mexico. Um, all of the components of a bird's annual cycle um, come into play when you want to understand why they're, they're declining. We really need to get at each of these different components. So all of the pieces of their breeding, uh, breeding season, their survivorship throughout the winter, uh, pot potentially where and uh, what they're doing during the winter, and migration, the, the periods in between those different seasons. They're all extremely important to, to uh, understand um, the life cycle of, of these grassland birds, of any bird actually. <laughs> um, in 2018, um, one of our partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with many other partners, um, published this full annual cycle conservation strategy for four particularly steeply declining um, grassland species, Sprague's pipit, chestnut collared and thick-billed longspurs, and Baird's sparrow. Um, migration in particular was pointed out as one large piece of their annual cycle that we don't have much knowledge about. We don't understand where grassland birds are going in particular during migration, uh, what, what flyways or what paths they're using, um, what kinds of stopover locations are they uh, using during migration, what kinds of habitats do they use. We do have some data, some eBird data that shows that 
grassland birds aren't just moving through grasslands during migration. Um, there's some particularly interesting eBird data here in Colorado showing uh, several longspurs, well, quite a few longspurs downed during a winter snowstorm up at uh, Cameron Pass along Highway 14. So these grassland birds are moving through the, uh, the mountains potentially as well. So um, we just don't understand a lot about their migration in particular. So those are the questions that we're really interested in trying to fill out, trying to understand, trying to fill those knowledge gaps here at Bird Conservancy. And that's really where MODIS um, can play a huge part. So the MODIS wildlife tracking system is essentially it's automated radio telemetry stations coupled with tagged animals. So birds and other animals are outfitted with radio transmitter tags and let go and released. And when one of those tagged individuals comes within roughly 15 to 20 kilometers of one of these stations, a detection is logged and the data is stored at that station. So what makes MODIS uh, particularly useful to us to be able to understand or study these uh, small grassland birds is that the tags themselves are small enough to be able to uh, be placed on these small birds and we don't have to recapture the birds to collect the data. <clears throat> the data is logged at the station itself. So we can simply attach the transmitter to the bird, let them go, and the stations do the work. Another cool component about MODIS is that the network as a whole works uh, together. So our stations will detect other people's tagged animals and everybody else's stations throughout the whole network will detect our birds as well, our, our tagged animals. So it really is a collaborative network in that manner. So I'll tell you a little bit about the different components of MODIS. Uh, the MODIS wildlife tracking system has two main components, the tags and the stations. And I'll start with a little information about the tags. So one uh, particularly useful and interesting thing about the tags is that they all transmit at the same frequency. So there's two manufacturers of tags and uh, all of the tags manufactured by those companies uh, function all on the same frequency. And that's important because um, these stations are just standing there <clears throat> across the landscape and they're just listening at those frequencies. So low tech tags transmit at 166 megahertz and the tags made by a company called Cellular Tracking Technologies transmit at 434 megahertz. And the stations are built out in such a way that they are able to listen for both of those frequencies. Um, it's important that these all transmit at that same frequency because the station doesn't have the ability to scan across frequencies uh, in order to detect these. So the way that we're able to identify the individuals who are tagged are that these tags send out a coded transmission with the different pulses or the different bursts uh, microseconds apart. And so it's those microsecond differences within that coded transmission that identify each of those individual tags. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I can try to explain it a little bit better if that doesn't, but um, that's essentially how the tags work and how the stations are able to identify individuals. The tags, like I said, are extremely small. Um, some of the tags are as small as 0.15 grams. Those tags actually are being applied to or um, uh, deployed on monarch butterflies and uh, dragonflies as well to study the movement of those. We're not doing that here at Bird Conservancy, but other partners within MODIS are. The tags also come in several different uh, power uh, flavors, <laughs> um, battery powered, solar powered, and then there's brand new ones that are hybrid, so they're battery and solar. Um, that have, they've got a battery and a solar power, uh, solar panel on it, and they're able to recharge that battery so that we can um, essentially get the lifetime of the bird, the movement throughout the entire life of the bird. The other component of the MODIS uh, wildlife tracking system is of course the stations. And um, these are the biggest part, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be put in place to build these out. Essentially, the stations are made up of um, antennas that are extremely high. You know, we try to get them as high as we can um, to get over the uh, surrounding vegetation and topography. 
Those antennas are attached by cables to the station computer. And there's three different kinds of station computers in use throughout the MODIS network. Um, the two different tag companies make their own station computer, of course. Uh, CTT makes a sensor station. Lowtech makes a receiver as well. But then uh, lots of users of MODIS are able to build their own stations uh, by cobbling together some consumer electronics and building what's called a sensor gnome. So on these uh, station computers, importantly, there's a component called an SDR or a software defined radio. And that is connected to the antennas via those cables and essentially a software defined radio. What that means is that the software itself tells those radios what frequency to listen to. I'm sorry, yeah, it tells the antennas uh, through the radios what frequency to listen uh, for. So these, these stations, the software is uh, programmed to listen at those frequencies those, that those tags are uh, transmitting at. Of course, each of these stations has a power source. Um, in a lot of cases, we're able to utilize existing power at a site, um, you know, typical 120 volt um, outlet that might be right there at the, the base of wherever we're installing this. But we're also able to use solar panels, uh, solar power setups in a lot of cases, and we do rely on that quite a lot. And then of course, the data that's collected needs to make its way back to um, the databases hosted by MODIS uh, and Birds Canada. And um, they do this either through an internet connection on site or by using a cellular modem on the station itself. So. There's several ways that that data can make its way back to the database. <coughs> Excuse me. So each of the stations are quite unique. Um, you know, we're able to utilize lots of different kinds of infrastructure to uh, build these stations. Here's a couple pictures. Here's a station at Cheyenne Bottoms uh, where we actually installed the entire tower, cemented a base down at the bottom of the, the, the tower there, connected it to this barn and put the, um, antennas on a mast high above the barn. Here's a uh, station in Marfa, Texas on the right there that we used an existing utility pole and just clamped a mast onto the top of it. And down at the bottom, we've got our computer and our solar panels and everything. Um, this is sitting out in the middle of a field. We just installed it uh, last week down in Marfa, Texas. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a couple more station designs. Um, in Greenbush, Kansas, down in the southeastern corner of uh, the state, we installed our antennas. They're really hard to see in, in this because they're several hundred feet up this communications tower. Um, so it was really nice to be able to get them really, really high in that area. And then the one here in Fort Collins uh, on the right, this is at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery uh, here in Fort Collins. And you can see this from the parking lot of the museum. You can see the antennas and that solar panel kind of peeking up over the wall. But on the backside, out of public view, this is what it looks like. All of our pieces bolted to the wall in kind of a complex uh, setup here. So there's lots of different ways that we can build these, these different stations. And I like to try to <clears throat> take advantage of existing infrastructure as much as we can so that it reduces the amount of work that we have to do. That, that station at Cheyenne Bottoms where we installed the tower, that took us several days. Um, but also when we utilize existing infrastructure, we're decreasing our footprint on the land and we're also um, decreasing the amount of potential perching habitats or uh, perches for predators of grassland birds. So uh, using existing infrastructure is, a, is extremely important along the way. So here's a map. Uh, this map shows what the MODIS network looked like in the summer of 2020 when we started our program here at Bird Conservancy. So you can see that uh, there's quite a few existing MODIS stations, these black dots um, out in the eastern part of the continent, um, and, and not very many in the west. Um, and especially here in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert region, <clears throat> there's not a lot of uh, station coverage which makes it quite difficult to answer those specific questions and research those specific things we're interested in for the species that we're um, interested in studying here in the Great Plains. So our plan here at Bird Conservancy is to build out the network within this region um, in a way that makes it so that we can study those birds. So here's a uh, quick kind of 
outline of, of our plans. <laughs> Um, this is very, very uh, basic and very general, but kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing. So Bird Conservancy has been studying grassland birds um, across the full annual cycle here in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert for quite some time. We've, got, we've done a lot of work down in the wintering um, grounds down into Mexico, and we've done a lot of work up in the northern Great Plains during the breeding season for these birds. And so we're using a lot of these existing partnerships that we've already got built um, through that other work to start our efforts here um, to develop the MODIS network. We're also presenting at lots of conferences and uh, participating in partnership webinars, uh, webinars such as Partners in Flight. Um, we've got a Western working group focused specifically on MODIS, and we're helping to plan and coordinate those meetings as well. Um, in the fall of last year, we, we held uh, two webinars with <clears throat> all of our partners from across the region who might be interested in utilizing MODIS in some capacity for their research that they've got going on. Those webinars are uh, viewable on our YouTube channel, which is linked there. If you're interested in going back and watching those, um, we, ha we had, <clears throat> in both of those, we had several hundred participants, um, which was really nice to get that much participation in our planning webinars. So from those webinars, we asked for information from these different partners about what research they're doing uh, that MODIS might play a role in. And also we kind of gained an idea of how to start uh, building out this network where we should focus our particular, our uh, specific efforts for the funding we had. Uh, beginning last year as well, we started installing stations and uh, we plan so far we've got funding to continue installations through 2023. Uh, we'll be hosting MODIS workshops. We've got one planned in Arizona in the spring of next year. Um, and at these workshops, we'll be teaching others who are interested in getting involved in MODIS how to do it <clears throat> and everything that they need to know about MODIS uh, to do it themselves, uh, installing these stations and uh, Tagging the birds and everything is a very uh, specific skill that might, you know, that's not necessarily in the uh, skill set of most avian biologists by any means. Um, we'll also be teaching them how to tag grassland birds and uh, beginning last year, continuing this year and moving forward, we'll continue tagging lots and lots of grassland birds um, in this region. So here's a quick timeline and of course everything depends on the pandemic. Um, so we started our project in 2020. Um, we were able to pull together a bunch of funding from lots of sources. And through this year, we've obtained funding for roughly 50 MODIS stations. And some of that funding um, is possible contracts to install stations for, for other organizations. Um, for instance, we were contracted last year to install two stations in the middle of Kansas. Um, so we've got funding for about 50 stations across this region. We held our webinars, of course, like I told you, and importantly, we initiated some very, uh, very good partnerships uh, surrounding MODIS. One of those partnerships in particular is a, a group of us who are all interested in tagging, uh, putting MODIS tags on birds, whether it's grassland birds or other species throughout this region. So within this partnership, we're, we're sharing resources to make it so that we can get more birds tagged with less effort um, by sharing tags, uh, sharing money and things like that within the partnership. So this year and last, we've been installing stations and trying to figure out where these stations are gonna go. Uh, in 2020, we were able to install four, install four stations and this year we did 15 and um, in these early times, we also install, uh, sorry, tagged 25 grassland birds. And I'll show you a couple of the interesting things we've learned just from those, those small amount of uh, grassland birds that we were able to tag a little bit later on in the presentation. So uh, like I told you, we've got funding for stations to be installed through 2023. Uh, we're gonna be holding some workshops and tagging a bunch of birds to begin answering those questions moving forward. And through this process, we're always looking for more uh, funding opportunities. These stations aren't, um, they're relatively affordable to install. They're not, they're not cheap by any means. Uh, each station can cost anywhere from 10 to, to $15,000, depending on the 
infrastructure needs at the site. And that figure also incorporates uh, travel costs um, and the salary for the, the people doing the installs, usually myself and another person here at Bird Conservancy. So we're always looking for more funding to be able to continue to fill out this network in such a way that we can then use it to do the research and uh, help stop the declines of these grassland birds. So by 2025, we're hoping that we've got the network um, developed in such a manner that we'll be able to uh, just go forward tagging grassland birds and really get at uh, some of these specific questions. So throughout this time, we're also uh, designing and building each of our stations for long-term sustainability and we're learning as we go. Um, this, this picture of the bent um, antennas was sent to me just this morning by our partner at Cheyenne Bottoms in Kansas. Um, the major winds that we experienced yesterday came through and blew this down. <laughs> and uh, so now it's bent and hanging down like this and we've got to get out there to repair it. But this is important and kind of shows, you know, um, how we've been adapting things. We installed this station last year and based on some experience and some input from others, we've been using a thicker pipe for these masts going forward uh, starting this year. Um, a, a pipe that's actually twice as thick, uh, the walls are twice as thick as what we used here. And so they're, they better, they would uh, better be able to withstand winds like what we experienced yesterday. Uh, so we're learning as we go, but we're really trying to build for long-term sustainability within the network uh, that we that we build out here. So here's a picture of our, a couple pictures of our MODIS traveling workshop. We pull this trailer around with this great uh, Toyota Tundra driving around to all of these different sites. And we're able to use this, this trailer as our workshop, actually pull it out right to where we're building the station and uh, build out all of the different components, the antennas and all the different pieces within that trailer and work in it. It's even got light as you can see in the photo there. Um, so we can work as it gets darker, but we're able to use this, this workshop to be able to install these stations across the landscape. I wanna show you a couple photos of some of the sites, some of the stations we've installed over the past couple of years um, to kind of give you a better idea of what we've been doing, but also an idea of how different these stations look. Um, they don't all look exactly the same and they don't look like, and a lot of them don't look like you would imagine. Um, so up in the left-hand corner, the top, um, here's a tarantula moving towards our, uh, our station down by Lamar, uh, Colorado, at the Southern Plains Land Trust. Uh, there's a house hosted by them. They had this tower out there and we're able to simply put our, our antennas up on top of it. Just below that is a uh, station installed on a barn at the Crane Trust along the Platte in uh, Nebraska, a very important place for cranes, uh, but also for grassland birds as well. They've got a lot of really great grasslands and pastures around there that grassland birds use to breed, but also use during migration. At that site at the Crane Trust, we've, uh, we were able to detect some Sprague's pipits that were tagged up in Montana not too long after we installed that station. On the right is a station at uh, Alamosa National Wildlife Refuge. You can see it's on a utility pole. We've got um, internet connection right there and we're using solar, uh, solar panels to power the station. Uh, we've been installing at a lot of National Wildlife Refuges here in Colorado and in Kansas, and we've got a lot more uh, of uh, refuges to install at in the future. On the left here, you can see a picture of Quivira National Wildlife Refuges Station. That's an important shorebird stopover site in uh, central southern Kansas. Um, it's kind of a salt plains place that the shorebirds really like, but there's also a lot of surrounding grasslands that grassland birds will use too. And then uh, out on the Pawnee grasslands in northern northeastern Colorado, on the Central Plains Experimental Range, we installed a station on this instrument hut attached to this large scale um, tower. The tower that you could kind of see in the distance there uh, has a lot of environmental sensors on, on it to uh, study climate change. So we were able to attach our station to this instrument hut. Um, so you can see there's a lot of different kinds of uh, stations 
and a lot of different designs uh, for our station installs that we've been using. So I'll stop at this photo and just ask if there are any questions um, so far. I know there's a lot of information that, that I've thrown out already, but I uh, just want to have a little period for, for any questions. Tyler, I don't know if anything's come through in the chat. It's hard to tell from my end. Yeah, nothing through the chat yet. I'm sure people are okay. just digesting. Um, okay. But I have a lot of people to to unmute themselves. So if you want to unmute and ask Matt a question right now, uh, it's yeah. a great time to do it. And if you, you want to type it into the chat, I can relay it as well. I hope that that Kansas one was the only one that bent. I'm sure you hope the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm I'm reaching out to everybody uh, after the windstorms and hope to hear back about uh, that things have been withstanding that way. So we'll see. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, I'll continue. Um, there'll be time at the end as well for questions. So I wanna tell you a couple stories about some of the stations, but also some of the, um, the, the birds that we've been able to tag and show you some of the interesting data that we've uh, brought back uh, or that we've gotten back early on in our project. Um, so this, this picture here is a picture of the station up at Soapstone Prairie Natural Area. It's a, uh, a prairie on the border of Wyoming uh, and Colorado. It's owned by the city of Fort Collins and it's a really, really beautiful short grass prairie kind of butting up right against the foothills to the west and moving out onto the plains on the east, um, fairly large property. They released um, black-footed ferrets here. So we've got the endangered black-footed ferret on site here, but they also brought um, bison in from Yellowstone. So this is the first site outside of Yellowstone that has purebred bison on it as well. So it's a very important prairie. Um, this prairie also has been home to some interesting bird things going on uh, in 2015, I think, 2015, 2016. Um, researchers with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and Bird Conservancy found Baird's sparrows up there. And the Baird sparrow is a bird that uh, breeds up in the Northern Great Plains, not here in Colorado. So it's a very interesting um, thing going on with Baird sparrows here at Soapstone. And we were able to um, find uh, breeding activity at Soapstone as well. And those birds have returned or some Baird sparrows have been at Soapstone every year since then. So um, we've used Soapstone as one of our sites where we can tag grassland birds close to home. So I wanna tell you a quick story about a, a Baird sparrow and a thick-billed longspur that we've been able to tag up at Soapstone. So we always get out bright and early before, actually dark and early <laughs> before the sunrise. Um, this is a picture uh, from June 22, June 22nd of 2020, when we went out to tag birds, we're able to see some pretty amazing sun uh, sunrises up at Soapstone. So we set up our mist nets. Um, we, we look around for where the birds are moving. We listen for them and watch them and set up our mist nets in a place that we know that they'll move through or that they've been hanging out in so that we can uh, more opportunistically catch them. And then we use playback. We uh, play the songs of the birds um, near the nets and crouch down in the grass and uh, hopefully catch those birds. So banding in a, in a prairie is, is much different than any other kind of banding you may have seen. <laughs> um, it's much more opportunistic. Once we catch that bird we're after, we have to move the nets and try to find another one. Um, so on June 22nd, we were able to catch a Baird sparrow. We banded it, you know, took all of the measurements and everything, and we also put a tag on it. So you could see the bird, I'm holding it on the, the left there in my hand. You might be able to see the antenna coming down off of the bird uh, going straight down the middle of that photo. It's kind of hard to tell but that is the antenna for the tag that we put on this Baird Sparrow. You can see on the right, my colleague, Erin Strasser here at Bird Conservancy, she is uh, putting the tag on the bird right now in that photo. And then here I am holding the bird um, and smiling at it. <laughs> or maybe we're looking literally at each other. We don't really know what to think of each other, but you can see the uh, antenna of the tag protruding off the back of the bird there. So the tags are applied to the bird um, using elastic band um, 
and the the elastic is is wrapped around the legs of the bird and it sits right between the wings just kind of above the tail uh, similar kind of like a backpack so we we sort of call it a a backpack attachment um, the tag does not get in the way of the wings the bird's able to move around and uh, function normally and that antenna is extremely flexible and simply just kind of uh, hangs out behind the bird. But that's our tagged Baird Sparrow from 2020. So we tagged that bird on June 22nd. Um, and interestingly, on July 6th, it showed up up in Saskatchewan at two different sites. Um, some other researchers were studying uh, shorebird movement in central Saskatchewan and had set up some temporary stations up there and detected our bird on July 6th. So that's an interesting thing. The bird moved several hundred miles to the north in the middle of the breeding season. And then on July 30th, it was detected back at Soapstone. So this is an example of some of the interesting and mind boggling <laughs> behavior that these birds do, grassland birds do during the season. So this is in the middle of its breeding season, potentially was breeding at Soapstone. And for some bizarre reason, flew all the way to Canada and uh, hung out up there for a little bit and then came back to Soapstone. This is not behavior that we would typically expect of birds. You know, we always think of birds flying to the north breeding, moving to the south wintering, flying to the north breeding, but these birds um, do move around quite a bit during those seasons. Um, and we really don't know why. This also points out a good um, example of how if there was more modus station coverage in between Soapstone and Canada, we may have uh, gotten a better idea of where this bird went. Did it kind of follow the mountains? Did it move out through the Dakotas? We really don't know without more coverage, but as we build out the network, we can start uh, honing in on what exactly that bird was doing. So that's the Baird Sparrow. Uh, just this year in June, we were able to catch two thick-billed long spurs. Um, you've got a male on the left and a female on the right. You can see the tag uh, antenna on the female on the right. We tagged both of these individuals um, that day and then let them go to uh, go about their business on Soapstone. And so I want to show you what this male did. Um, we we actually detected this bird kind of irregularly from the day that it was uh, tagged all the way through about the middle of August. And then from the middle of August all the way through the beginning of October, we detected it at Soapstone every single day. And we had start to kind of think that, you know, did this bird die? Did it drop the tag? We really didn't know. And we'd started considering heading out to Soapstone to uh, try to track this bird down using handheld telemetry and see if we could figure out what's going on with it. Um, but on October 19th, we built this station down near Lamar uh, at the Southern Plains Land Trust house. And five days later, this male uh, long spur was detected at that station. So that's pretty interesting, a couple hundred miles to the Southeast. And it was opportunistic that we just had, you know, happened to install the station five days before that bird flew past. But that's not all. This bird on that same day was detected nine hours later in the panhandle of Oklahoma um, at a station that's owned and operated by some researchers studying long spur movement in the winter. Um, those researchers are based out of Oklahoma University or University of Oklahoma. Um, and it's interesting, this bird, um, you know, was detected on that same day. So we can we can kind of get an understanding that this bird was potentially migrating at that time. Um, and these are really the only stations that it had the potential of being detected at. Um, so as we build out the network, we'll be able to hone in more, like I said, on um, the specific movement that these birds are doing. You know, had it been moving down from Soapstone all the way from October 1st to October 24th, we don't really know. But we do know that on October 24th, it moved from Lamar down to Clayton, New Mexico. So that's interesting. <laughs> so this is a map kind of showing our plans going forward. Um, all of the yellow dots out in the east and to the west of us are existing MODIS stations. 
you could see our our uh, existing moda stations kind of in the mess right there in the middle in Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado. But these pins all represent uh, stations that we are planning to install uh, coming up soon. So all the blue and purple pins in Colorado, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, and Wyoming, uh, and even New Mexico and Arizona <laughs> are stations that we will be installing this year and, and next, uh, probably most next year. The uh, sort of brown bronze pins with the square in the middle, those are national parks within the region. Um, we've been approached by national parks to potentially get MODA stations at important national park properties throughout this region. The orange pins down in Mexico, those are our planned stations to be built down in Mexico. We've got 10 of those down there that are funded. Uh, we're still working out details of how that's gonna happen. Um, building a station is, is quite involved and building those in Mexico can be uh, much more difficult because of the lack of infrastructure or the lack of uh, available tools or available equipment to be able to do this in, in a lot of cases, especially in the most remote areas. And then those green pins that you see up in the north, those are partner planned stations. So there's a lot of partners working in the uh, Northern Great Plains on breeding uh, work. And those are the, the stations they're planning on installing over the next year or two. You can see the orange region is the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert that I showed you. And within that, there's all these little orange blobs and red blobs. The orange blobs are um, remaining intact grasslands, specific grasslands of uh, important conservation value. And we use those, those grasslands and the placement of those grasslands to identify uh, important places to put our stations, oh, excuse me, to study grassland birds in particular. The little tiny red blobs that you may or may not be able to see on here are national wildlife refuges within the region. And we've been working closely with US Fish and Wildlife to identify refuges to put stations on too. So I wanna step back from our plans here at Bird Conservancy a little bit to show you how all of this fits within the greater uh, MODIS network throughout the West and what role Bird Conservancy has been playing. So part of my funding here at Bird Conservancy comes from Birds Canada. Birds Canada is a nonprofit based in um, Ontario and they are the headquarters of MODIS. So they are the ones that house the MODIS database and um, help everyone throughout the entire network get involved in MODIS and kind of support everybody throughout the network um, from a technical kind of end. Uh, their website is modis.org. You can take a look at it. Um, and, and see more information and see all of these different sites and things uh, on a map on that stage, on that, that website. So as you can see throughout the West here, there's a lot of information, a lot of uh, partners and a lot of people working on MODIS things, a lot of organizations, a lot of universities, and um, a lot of uh, agencies, so federal and state agencies. Through that funding from Birds Canada, my role, uh, is to coordinate all of these large scale efforts out here in the West. And so I wanna show you, um, you know, how we've been playing a role coordinating all of these efforts and who's doing what out here. So I'll start kind of with who's doing what. I'll start with Mary Whitfield at the Southern Sierra Research, Research Station. She's based in Southern California. Um, they're studying tricolored blackbirds and willow flycatchers and yellow-billed cuckoos and using MODIS uh, within California to understand the movement within the state of these tricolored blackbirds. She's also spearheading some efforts in Central America to understand uh, the wintering range of those willow flycatchers that she's been working on. Mary has also been very important in MODIS as a whole because she spearheaded this Partners in Flight initiative uh, surrounding MODIS. In 2018, she wrote a prospectus, essentially a document kind of spelling out what MODIS could be in the Western half of the continent. And that document has been very important to kind of spearhead the efforts, but also to get people involved. If somebody had not heard about MODIS or not heard about what it could do in the West, we could simply pass that document along. And that has been really important for our efforts here at Bird Conservancy, but also for everybody else's efforts out in the West here. They also host a, um, a map where all of us can put our planning 
uh, information, our planned and potential station locations so that we can all see how those stations uh, might relate to each other as we coordinate efforts and as we think of our own efforts. Um, and as we think kind of larger scale of how to build out the network. Um, in the, the Northwest, there's this Intermountain West collaboration. Uh, they've got several different projects. They're spearheaded by MPG Ranch, a uh, big ranch up in Montana that has a lot of research going on on it. Um, and there's universities and bird observatories and other agencies and organizations involved in these efforts in the uh, Intermountain West. These project numbers that you can see on the screen, project 213, 226, those are the MODIS projects. So if you go on the MODIS website and look up these projects, you can see um, where their stations are placed and you can see what birds they have tagged, uh, all of these different projects and who all is involved in them. More information about the uh, Intermountain West projects can be found on MPG Ranch's website, mpgranch.com. Uh, in Western Canada, there's a lot of agencies and universities um, working on efforts up there to study the movement of uh, shorebirds and Swainson's thrushes. Here's their project numbers and a lot of the organizations involved. And then here's some important contact for people who are working in that region, contact info for people who are working in that region, Amy, uh, Wendy, and Kira. Um, and like I said, studying Swainson's thrush and different shorebird. Here's a picture of them tagging a Swainson's thrush and a uh, Dunlin right in the middle. And then in central Canada, there's several organizations working on shorebird uh, movement and passerine work too. So University of Saskatchewan has been spearheading uh, a full annual cycle study of shorebirds um, that breed in central Saskatchewan and winter down in Peru and Chile. So they've got stations in Saskatchewan as well as down in South America to study the movement of those shorebirds. And the passerine work typically uh, has been focusing on um, colonial species or colony nesting species such as swallows. Uh, there in Saskatchewan or central Canada. Here's a couple photos and some contact info if you're interested. Christy Morrissey heads up the shorebird work and Kevin Cardinal is a contact for the uh, swallow research. And then of course our efforts here in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert uh, with lots of our partners right there. Like I talked, I showed you all about this earlier, but there's our project number uh, 281. And then in the Northern Great Plains, there's a lot of people working on breeding, uh, breeding information, uh, breeding work for grassland birds. Organizations like Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and US Fish and Wildlife, as well as up into Canada, the Environment and Climate Change Canada um, Agency are working up there. And we are too. We just received funding for 10 more stations to be placed up in the NGP. And we hope to host a workshop up there as well. And then down kind of towards the, uh, the Southern Great Plains, Chihuahuan Desert region, there's a tightly, uh, tightly packed little network of MODIS stations um, run by Oklahoma University and Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center to study the winter movement of uh, long spurs in particular. And that's all right there in the panhandle of uh, Oklahoma stretching into New Mexico and Northern Texas. And so that's kind of what's going on in the region. Um, but one of our coordinated efforts, one of the ways we coordinate things is uh, we have a monthly meeting of all of these different um, people who are working within those areas. Um, people down into Mexico and even in Central America participate in these meetings. And these are an opportunity for us to discuss specific projects, um, details of what we're working on, barriers we might come up against, funding opportunities that we might uh, find that could be kind of region-wide funding opportunities, um, issues we come up against, such as this, this uh, tower being bent in the wind, um, tech questions and problems and things like that. So this is a very important meeting for all of us to be able to share info and share learning experiences um, with, with each other um, so that 
we can do MODIS in the West uh, in, in the best way possible. So a couple of really cool projects uh, also going on in the West are there's a, there's a big push amongst national wildlife refuges to build MODIS and incorporate MODIS at the different refuges. Uh, like I said earlier, we've been able to install MODIS stations at a lot of refuges in Colorado and Kansas. Um, but Scott Summershoe and Orion Richmond are leading the efforts to get MODIS stations throughout the western uh, half of the country at National Wildlife Refuges. And if you're not familiar, refuges are extremely important bird spots or spots for birds, uh, stopover locations, breeding locations, wintering locations. And as birders, um, you know, from the point of view of a birder, wildlife refuges can be very, very good spots to go birding as well. I'm sure you're familiar with several of them uh, that, are, that are highly prized birding locations. Another cool US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service effort is going on at Department of Defense bases. So biologists who are based at these bases or uh, sited at these bases <laughs> are interested in um, using MODIS to uh, partially meet the Base Sykes Act requirements. So Sykes, the Sykes Act is a piece of legislation that requires military reservations to um, effectively coordinate and conserve the wildlife uh, coordinate the conservation of wildlife on those bases. And so these biologists are interested in utilizing MODIS um, as a tool to be able to monitor uh, the use of birds and other wildlife on uh, the base itself. So we've been working closely with these biologists um, here in Colorado and in Kansas and Oklahoma to help them get um, MODIS stations built on their bases. And then there's a really cool effort up in North Dakota, um, led by a lady at um, University of North Dakota, who is uh, getting some MODIS stations placed around a base up there as well. So that's a, that's a pretty cool effort going on. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot going on <laughs> with MODIS, uh, especially out here in the West. It really is kind of the Wild West period for MODIS right now. Um, there's a lot of interest and excitement at each of our Partners in Flight Western Working Group MODIS meetings. We have over 100 participants um, attend these, and everybody's really excited, and new um, efforts keep popping up all the time. And importantly, Bird Conservancy, we've really been able to um, place ourselves as leaders of what's going on with MODIS out here in the West. So through my role as coordinating efforts throughout the West, but also through our role leading these partners in flight meetings and really being a place that people go for um, resources, for information about MODIS, we've really placed ourselves to be the leaders of MODIS efforts in the West. So I will stop there. As you can tell, my voice is about to go, <laughs> but um, I'd like to open up for any questions that you might have. And I'll leave it on this slide. Here's my email address if you'd like to learn more information about our efforts or more information about MODIS uh, as a whole, you can send me an email. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thanks so much, Matt. I, that was so interesting. I feel like, you know, I'm in the loop with all things MODIS, but it's cool just to see it all planned out like, through this webinar. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came up. Uh, so how many stations do we currently have in Colorado? And then how many are, do we plan to have in Colorado specifically? Yeah, we have, um, I think there's eight stations in Colorado. And uh, it's kind of spread throughout the whole state. Well, uh, the western, sorry, the eastern half of the state. We have two stations up in the mountains as well at the, the parks. So one at uh, San Luis Valley and one at North Park. Um, I don't know that we really have a goal of, you know, a specific number within the state itself, um, but we really want to be able to cover the uh, eastern half of the state specifically with MODIS stations to be able to understand how grassland birds are using the state. Um, and so there's still a lot of room for expansion uh, throughout the eastern half of the state. But there are also researchers at US Fish and Wildlife Service and um, 
at uh, University of Denver who are interested in studying bird movement in the mountains as well. And so there will probably be more stations installed within the mountains, within the mountain parks particularly, but within the mountains too, uh, to be able to study other birds other than grassland birds. So, you know, when all is said and done, I would, I would expect, you know, 20 to 25 stations, maybe, maybe more uh, within the state. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then how long are the antennas that are placed on these birds? Um, do they range in size? Or are they all kind of just one size? Yeah, the antennas, um, the length of the antennas on the tag, uh, depending on the manufacturer of the tag, they're the same length. So all the low tech tags have the same length of antenna and the CTT tags have the same length of antenna. And the length of that antenna is a, um, it's a specific portion of the wavelength of that frequency. So we could think about <laughs> the, um, oh, I can't remember exactly what the, the formula is, but you can calculate the wavelength of a frequency um, using the speed of light. And um, the wavelength at 166 megahertz is like 2.8 meters. And so that, that um, I'm sorry, 1.8 meters. That that antenna on the tag itself is a, um, a small part of that wavelength. I think it is exactly 18 centimeters. So it's a small portion of that wavelength. And they have to be that way in order for them to function correctly at that frequency. So um, they're all the same, but they are, uh, it's important. It's an important length that those antennas are. Cool. <laughs> Um, if anyone else has any questions, we have a couple more minutes before we let Matt get back to, to what he's got to do for the day. Um, so feel free to either unmute if you have any questions um, or type them into the chat. Uh, but if there's not much more, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, that was a lot of really great information. I feel like you did a great job of explaining, of course, of what it is and how we're doing it and the uses of it. It's going to be so cool to, to see the, the growth of it throughout the years. Um, yeah. And if for the people on here, you should definitely check out the MODIS website. Um, I typed it into the chat and I'll include it with our follow-up email. Uh, but the MODIS website is really interactive. You can look up all these really cool projects. It's open to the public. Um, so you can see different projects that are being used uh, and the different birds that are tagged. And it's, I don't know, I can spend a lot of time on that website. Um, <laughs> reminds me of a kind of eBird exploring on eBird. Yeah, yeah. Um, also keep an eye on our website, birdconservancy.org. Um, coming up soon, there's going to be a blog post that I wrote, or that uh, Aaron Youngberg, Aaron Strasser, and I wrote about the uh, entire year, kind of a year in review. So keep an eye out for that. Awesome. Well, looks like we're, we don't really have any questions. So thank you so much, Matt. You covered everything. Uh, it sounds like everyone is just good. Um, so thank okay. you for taking the time. I really, really appreciate this, Matt. And it's good to work yeah. with you on this. Um, for everyone else, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you listening. and. Hopefully you can uh, share the news about MODIS and, and start educating others about this and how we're using it. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday week and end of the year, and it's going to be 2022 before we know it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you again, Matt. I hope everyone has a great day. Yeah, thank you.